Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge 16, brought to you by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back to wrap up Knowledge 16. The Cube has been here, wall to wall coverage for three days. Jeff Frick and I have really been a pleasure. This is our fourth year at uh, ServiceNow Knowledge, and it just keeps growing and growing. Uh, Jeff, we're seeing the continued steady march of ServiceNow. I think, you know, my summary on this week, the financial analyst meeting on Monday, the three days of, of keynotes, and all the conferences within the conferences, the CIO Decisions of a event, the Creator Con, et cetera. Um, I break it down into four areas. So the business, product innovation, the ecosystem, and the developer community. And um, so let me start with some thoughts on the business. As I said, we're seeing, we're witnessing the steady, consistent execution ethos emerging uh, in service now. The expansion of the TAM, growing from what was a, you know, initially $8 billion TAM, you know, it, it grew a little bit further from there, and then I had pegged it at two years ago at 30 billion, now it's, you know, up 60 billion plus. So they've done a fantastic job of taking this platform and just pointing it at different markets. This is one of us, the CEO's toughest jobs in a growth company is how do you continue to expand the TAM so you can keep fueling the beast? And ServiceNow looks like it's got a long runway uh, ahead of it. Still, basically, you know, 50% penetration in IT within the US just for its core market. Many more opportunities outside of IT just getting started overseas you know, in a meaningful way. So a lot more growth you know, going there. So you're seeing a, an execution ethos. Now at the same time, ServiceNow is entering uncharted territory. Um, certainly for this management team, um, but they seem quite capable, but they're bringing in new capabilities. We talked to the new CIO, focused on scale, sort of the next phase of growth you know, for this company. And what we saw as part of that whole TAM expansion was Frank Slupin laying out the three great estates in software. Like I said, he skipped a couple early on, the mainframe stuff, we don't have to worry about that, but the ERP estate, popularized by Oracle and SAP, the CRM estate, you know, initially popularized by Siebel and then just dominated by Salesforce, and then service management being the umbrella that's going to encompass all these systems of record and systems of engagement to really try to bring you know, a single view of your operation. And that's really the opportunity that ServiceNow is putting forth, which seemed to resonate very well with the customers. Your thoughts on the business vector? Well, I, again, I think the ITSM angle is, is, is a specific one, but if you look at it in the context of a shared service, you know, all companies have a number of shared services. And if you can continue to approach, <clears throat> excuse me, if from the shared services angle, especially as we had a number of conversations uh, talking about enabling people to actually start to break down the shared services and the cost of the shared services and map it back to business functions and business applications so people can make more informed decisions. Obviously, we know they're doing stuff in HR. We know they're doing stuff in finance. We know they're doing stuff in, in uh, facilities management. So these are kind of these uh, necessary processes that happen in all companies, especially large companies at scale, that you know they, they see just everything X as a service and have demonstrated that they can start to execute that way. So I think the TAM is, is large. I mean, the, the one that we talked about that we don't see as much kind of talk about is on the small side, right, the SMB side. And maybe it's just because they don't need to go there yet. They got enough big fish to fry uh, on the big companies. But we've heard consistently in, in a number of the guests we had on over the last three days, uh, came at it from the HR angle, came at it from a facilities angle, came at it from a different angle than the, kind of the classic customer. So it seems like shared services as a, as a bigger category than the IT management, um, it's a big opportunity. Well, I think I've been thinking about this, this issue of you know, the Express that they announced, you know, well, I guess last year or a year before, I can't remember now, but for, for smaller customers. But I think the reason why we didn't hear so much about that is because their main core is still IT. It's, you know, SMB, they don't have IT. Right, right, that's <laughs> All true. All the cloud. You're right. And so I think my, my expectation would be as ServiceNow matures into the business lines, it's going to cycle back and take a page out of the, the, the CRM playbook, the Salesforce playbook. And so I'm hopeful, you know, as a potential consumer of this platform. Um, on the product innovation side, you know, it's one thing to have a big TAM. You've got to get 
product out of R&D, this company spends about 15% of its revenue on R&D, you gotta get it out of R&D into a product pipeline and you have to be agile and, 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 and able to do that. And I think we're, we saw that with ITOM. Um, ServiceNow enhanced its ITOM portfolio with some acquisitions of Nebula, uh, ITAP, which got it into the orchestration and automation business, going after things like OpenStack now and, and, and orchestrating you know, Chef and Puppet, you know, et cetera, cloud management. So that's a, a big growth area. The other piece is service management across the enterprise, you know, beyond just IT. We've heard about that for you know, some years, but we heard, for instance, from Jen Stroud, we're gonna, I know we're gonna talk about you know, guests in a minute, but you know, HR obviously is a big area, facilities is a big area, uh, and you're seeing that continual expansion. And then I say customer service now, really extending across the enterprise. So those are some really big areas. The other one is security. I'm very personally very excited about the security initiatives that we heard. We made that a big theme, certainly of day two and parts of day three. And I think, you know, huge problem. And I think ServiceNow has nailed it because everybody's still focused on the technologies to either detect or keep the bad guys out. What ServiceNow is focused on is the response. And I think you're increasingly over the next five years going to see a massive shift toward that response. How do we respond to the inevitable threat, which we know is happening, we know there are intrusions, it takes hundreds of days to detect intrusions. How do we now respond? How do we manage all that data, all those incidents? How do we determine which response we should, which, was, which, which uh, uh, attacks we should prioritize a response toward? And that's the, the problem that ServiceNow is attacking. So, huge opportunities there. And then, of course, the extension of the platform, and that's really, we heard a lot about that today. Um, you know, the UX, the UI. So, again, thoughts on the product pace, th uh, uh, pace of innovation there. Again, I would, I would just uh, point people to, to Sean's interview from earlier today, Alan's interview uh, from earlier today. Uh, there's been a number of them, and as you've been kind of pounding the security angle, and it, it does seem to be a very clear shift to Security is basically risk management, treat it as risk management, make your uh, dis investment decisions around risk management, really define what you're trying to secure, the value you're trying to secure, prioritize, and then, as I said, everything you ever needed to know you learned in kindergarten, right? You need to practice a fire drill. Uh, you need to practice the response. You need to put the processes in place. I think, so, uh, from the day from Oshkosh said, you know, establish your relationships in smooth seas so when things get rough, you're ready to go. And so it's really kind of a discipline of being kind of security ready and security focused as an action plan as opposed to, you know, a binary we are or are not secure. Because um, Sean made a great line, you know, you need to work under the assumption that people are constantly trying to penetrate your, your borders. The third area I want to talk about is ecosystem. Um, when we first sort of you know, bumped into the ecosystem of ServiceNow four years ago, we said, wow, there's a couple of things that we noted. One is, you know, other than KPMG, the big SIs, you know, weren't here with a big presence. Um, but we saw a lot of innovation. We saw a lot of opportunities for M&A, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we started to see some moves last year in the ecosystem. Cloud Sherpas being acquired by Accenture, CSC acquiring fruition. Very interesting that the way in which Accenture's aggressively integrating Cloud Sherpas where CSC is saying, no, we're going to not mess with it. We're going to keep fruition separate and sort of make that a separate opportunity and let management go do its thing. And I think they can both work. You know, that's a cultural decision that they, they make there. Uh, but also, uh, uh, KPMG continuing its big presence here, sort of skated to the puck on this one. You know, usually these big SIs, they like to, as they say, eat from the trough and they wait until the big money is there and then they dive in. KPMG made some some good bets there, and I think they're, they're paying off. Um, and then a lot of new applications emerging in the ecosystem, some industry specificity. So still some things to, uh, to watch there, the, the evolution of that ecosystem. I like to see the ecosystem be able to do more pulling of ServiceNow in. I think right now ServiceNow is doing most of the selling and bringing the ecosystem in. I think that's going to change, especially with the Accenture acquisition of Cloud Sherpa. I think Accenture can really start to drive some big business for ServiceNow, as can KPMG and CSC. The other thing to watch in the ecosystem is, we, I learned this from Todd Nielsen of uh, VMware days when he was the president of VMware. He used to come up with a stat that every, for every dollar spent on VMware, there's N dollars spent on, uh, uh, within the, or, or on the ecosystem products, and that number was very large. It was 
you know, 1 to 13, and then it went to 1 to 15, and 1 to 17, and then VMware changed its pricing, and people stopped talking about that. <laughs> but, but that's a signal. If the ecosystem can make money, think about the great ecosystems, you know, Microsoft's e ecosystem as, a, right. as an example. That massive ecosystem where uh, the partners made money. That's what it's all about. Right, and so right. that's something to watch that... Um, I think we're going to start to see here as this company, you know, breaks through. It's broken through a billion in revenue. And e on that. EY was here as well. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So I left out EY. Right. So we had them. We had them all. And as you said, they don't come into a marketplace unless they think there's a lot of money to be made, and they see demand from their customers that they can start to establish, you know, basically practices around these. So I think that's a a huge signal, exterior signal that there's a lot of uptake, interest, and opportunity in delivering these applications to large customers. The other part I thought was interesting, um, I think it was from, from CSC, really looking at the opportunity that, yes, you know, we've historically done infrastructure Im implementations and management, et cetera, but we too see that there's higher value activities within our world beyond managing other people's infrastructure around solutions like ServiceNow that we can you know, do process change and management change and transformation change and not, you know, and have less of our total billing go into infrastructure build and infrastructure management. Again, I think a continuing uh, path uh, down this journey of, you know, non-differentiated heavy lifting, go with a specialist and, and really focus your own energies on places that you can differentiate. And that's not in putting racks of servers together. Yeah, what did Alan call them? The server huggers, right? The server huggers. So the fourth vector I want to talk about is developers. And that was kind of a big theme uh, toward the end of the day today. Um, you know, we heard some great research from, from John Forrester. You know, this notion of low code, you know, slash no code, citizen developer, it's emerging, as John said. It's, it's not really well defined. But you kind of know it when you see it, you know, and you see it here. And as I said a number of times today, companies like ServiceNow, IBM, HP, e EMC, uh, certainly Microsoft, et cetera, they covet the developer community. Now, many are doing a great job. You see AWS just sort of lives off the developer community. But others, it's like pushing a rock uphill. Just really amazing to me that ServiceNow said, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this and see what happens. And then developers came out of the woodworks maybe not traditional full stack developers, but guys that are writing apps. And that's huge for leverage because that's where so much innovation is going to come. Um, and because you know, the platform company can't do it all. And so cultivating developers, meeting the needs of that developer community is something that you know, any software company needs to do. And I think ServiceNow is doing it in a unique and differentiated way and one that's clearly gaining traction. <laughs> I talked to a few of the ServiceNow folks uh, before the keynote kicked off this morning in, in the general session, and like, yeah, now we start our CreatorCon, a 3,000-person developer conference, which, you know, it's a conference within a conference for a lot of people, 3,000 people is a big show. We go to a lot of shows. It's not an insignificant show. So to have that kind of attraction uh, inside of this conference uh, is pretty meaningful. I think what's, what's more interesting is kind of this... Uh, high def code, low code, and no code deployment options within the platform, because as we, as we spoke to John um, from Forrester, to get enough developers, we have to kind of change the way we think about development, and it's not just what's traditionally been the hardcore developers, but it's people that don't either do development full time or don't look at full stack development, and I thought it was um, interesting what as Jonathan talked about, uh, Jonathan Sparks talked about one of the, the customers they work with who just uses web development coders and then they, they learn up on ServiceNow because they've now been unencumbered from being attached to either building out infrastructure and or kind of the classic backend coders who were really a gate to their ability to deliver. So that's an interesting twist on it as well where you don't necessarily have to have the back end that's now kind of wrapped up in a platform and you could focus on the front end and, and delivering new applications. So I, I go back to uh, you know, the whole chauffeur problem. You know, these cars are never going to work because there aren't enough chauffeurs. We have to change a definition of what developers are and I think the low code and no code is a big piece of that puzzle. Yeah, and then I think the other comment I want to make is just the whole messaging of the event. We, when we go to these events, we always test the keynote messaging, does it resonate? Does it, is it actually happening in the field with customers? Do customers buy into it? Or is it just more sort of you know, good messaging? <laughs> Cloud meets big data, <laughs> as an example. <laughs> it was great messaging. It's like, okay, where's the beef? Um, but so, 
What you see with ServiceNow is they lay out the problem. We have stovepipe processes. They describe the way in which the state of work today, they provide research on that state of work. The crowd nods and says, yes, we've, you know, we've been there. Uh, you know, Frank Slootman going back to his, his days of saying, you know, uh, desk is a four-letter word and you know, getting some booze, but, but now everybody sort of agrees with that. So really good job of laying out that messaging and then connecting that to the ServiceNow value proposition in a way that's not you know, gratuitous. You know, it's just right. well done. So you know, props to the folks that uh, are you know, crafting those messages. And I think actually the reason why it's so good is because they live it, they breathe it, it's organic. You know, and then they shape it obviously in a way that's very professional. Uh, they spend a lot of time on the keynotes. You know, we saw that. The, the keynotes were very well done, um, very well rehearsed, and, and it showed. Uh, but in, and the jokes worked, you know, so, so that's all good. <laughs> guests, another big highlight. So two of the best guests we've ever had on theCUBE, John Cleese, which was just like no guest we've ever seen. <laughs> um, really wasn't much of an interview, but he just did his thing. And it was, was a fun. lot of fun and it was quite <laughs> unique. And then this year, Dr. Robert Gates, the 22nd U.S. Secretary of Defense and the head of the CIA under eight presidents he served, which was... Really an honor to be able to interview him. I thought he was great, not as fun as John Cleese, but heck of a lot of substance. A lot of substance, but again, too, he went through at the beginning of that interview, and, and again, I encourage people to go watch it, and went through, and you talked about it, leaders born or they made, and he went through eight characters, <laughs> character traits that he said you can't learn in college, but these are the traits that great leaders have. And <laughs> I got this kindergarten theme in my mind because these are simple things that you learn, but it's curiosity and it's integrity and it's empathy and it's, it's really fundamental stuff. So that was a terrific interview. Obviously, uh, you know, Fred is fantastic and I, and I just want to go back to the word delightful. There's a bunch of cultural things at this company that are very atypical to a tip, uh, kind of the tech world and tech shows we cover. To, 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 to focus on a delightful experience um, I think is a pretty special thing that he just flat out, you know, brought right to the to the front. This is what we what we want to do. I think it's reflected in the cakes, which we make a lot of jokes about. But you know, culture matters, and and actually, Mr. Gates uh, talked about culture matters, and that's part of the culture here. And it kind of goes back to the fun and 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 kind of the energy you felt with the with the hackathon winners. Um, the fact that F Fred is. Uh, still the leader and still coding and is so passionate and stood up and said, this is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in 40 years of programming in front of 11,000 customers, employees, and analysts. And that's pretty meaningful. And it's very fortunate for a company of this size, a show of this size, to have the personality uh, that everybody can get behind, believes in, and stands up there and, 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 and shows code. And then, of course, he broke his own code and broke his own demo, which, was, which I thought was pretty funny too. You're like, ah, I shouldn't have been hacking on that stuff. So, you know, he, he's a special person. And as we've said time and time again, you know, founder-led companies that have that original vision and energy have a distinct advantage over, you know, kind of hired guns, I think. So there's a very, also a very subtle, sometimes not so subtle, um, positioning or depositioning of CRM. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. ServiceNow hasn't done that in the past. So some of the things I'm going to be watching, obviously ITOM adoption, you know, that's going to be big. And of course, business line adoption that started sort of maybe last year or the year before and in HR and you know, facilities and, and so forth and legal. We'll see how that continues. I expect it'll continue to, to grow and fill that, that large TAM. Um, the whole notion of service management across the enterprise, that's something that we'll be watching. Customer service, this is, this is a big, bold initiative. Um, you know, can ServiceNow change the way in which organizations work? There are a lot of entrenched processes out there that are really hard to break. We all want them to be broken, but change is sometimes very, very difficult, so we'll be watching for that. And I think a key to that is going to be the ecosystem contribution to that change. I don't think one company can do it alone. Obviously, we watch growth because they're a public company. It's easy to sort of track that. And also the continued innovation, that R&D pipeline turning into product at speed. It seems to be accelerating. We'll obviously be watching that. Your last thoughts, I'll give you the last word. Same thing, I, I, you know, 
work is difficult. There's a lot of processes we deal with. The, the amount of email is, is, a, is a universal pain in everyone's backside as it continues to grow and grow and grow. So I think we really need methods to make work life easier, aggressively automate where we can um, so that we can do higher value activities. Everybody's too busy. There's not enough developers. So there's a, there's a number of really big issues that ServiceNow is trying to address. And uh, they've got traction. They've got a, a dedicated following. And as we say time and time again, it's a great show, it's a great energy. It feels like a small a new show, but it's 11,000 people, 12,000 people. And I'm sure they'll be just as enthusiastic uh, next year in Orlando. All right, well I think that's a wrap guys. Great job, Patrick. Well done. Appreciate uh, your lead, Seth leadership this Jay, week. Seth and Brendan. Jay and Brendan. Really appreciate it, Bert. <laughs> as always, Bert, thank you for <laughs> documenting the, the Cube on the crowd chats and Kristen and, and your team. That's a wrap, everybody. This is theCUBE signing out from Knowledge16. Thanks for watching. This is a tale of two businesses. Like most businesses, their employees are key to their success. Sometimes they need to bring more people on board, fast. And this is where these two businesses do things very differently. One is using technology to make the job of filling jobs, well, a lot less work. The other still does things the old way. We're helping forward-thinking companies like Envision bring new hires on board faster and easier than ever. New job offers are accepted with just a click, instead of printing, mailing, and waiting. Administrative and financial documents are seamlessly submitted, instead of eating up the entire first day. Clearances and IDs are quickly processed, not stalled. And when it's time to suit up, new hires are ready, not waiting. If questions do come up, answers are right at employees' fingertips.